All right, guys. Welcome to uh, the next talk here on this wonderful, wonderful Sunday morning. Thank you guys for showing up and getting out of bed and rolling into, uh, into the track. Uh, right now, I've got the pleasure to introduce Dylan on stage, who's going to be talking about fighting secrets in Source with Truffle Hog. So please welcome him to the TourCon stage. Thank you for the kind introduction. Can folks hear me okay? Yeah. Cool. Um, so basically, uh, I, I wrote this tool uh, a little while ago that does, um, as described, it, it helps identify um, secrets committed to source code. Um, and I'm just going to be talking about why I wrote it, um, what sort of the motivations were, how to use it, um, and what sort of the path forward looks for it. Um, so, uh, you know, at a, at a high level, I think I need to start with like why I'm trying to solve this problem in the first place. Like, what is this problem? Is it a problem? Um, so uh, I think um, most folks are probably, uh, at least at a high level, familiar with um, certain security incidences and breaches that have occurred from secrets being committed to source code. Um, that's generally uh, as a result of secrets being committed to source code and that source code becoming open source. Um, but there are instances that also occur from um, internal source code as well. It can also be used for lateral movement. So if you move onto a machine and that machine has source code, developer workstation or production machine, um, you can potentially extract secrets um, from that uh, source code and then move laterally um, with the use of those credentials. Um, it can also help elevate privilege. Um, same idea, you take a credential from the source code, you move to another machine in the environment, and you may have elevate your privilege that way. Um, sometimes exploitation can be hard to detect of this. Uh, if you grab a, a, a credential and you use it against a public cloud endpoint, it can be very hard for an organization to tell whether or not that credential was um, used for a legitimate reason from the application or being used by the um, malicious person. Um, if, uh, if, a, if a workstation gets lost, and those secrets are hard-coded on disk, um, it can be really easy uh, to, to pull those secrets out if you don't have full disk encryption set up. Um, and then uh, the last bullet point here, um, source code is kind of leaky. Like, you may accidentally expose your .git directory on your website, and then all of a sudden all your source code becomes public. Or someone internally may intentionally publish your source code. Or your source code may get paste-binned, or a hundred other reasons. Um, I'm sure folks uh, in in the audience are very familiar with these types of things, but ultimately um, source code ends up sort of leaking out in ways that we can't really control. And so to help prevent um, the, uh, the fallout from that, we, we, we try to not put secrets in source code. Um, so this is a, one example. Um, so Reed, the guy that runs uh, B-Sides SF, uh, he also works at HackerOne, paid out uh, $2,000 to the HackerOne, HackerOne bug bounty. Um, because someone uh, submitted uh, an issue basically saying, hey, Reed, uh, you published <laughs> your uh, uh, GitHub token to, um, to public GitHub, um, and they, they paid him out two grand for that. Um, this is another example. Some researcher just went to, to GitHub and, and just did sort of like a, a Google dork style, uh, let me search for all the Slack tokens and found 1,500 of them, so he was able to just squat in all those slacks. And you can imagine, like, tons of those tokens probably belong to companies, and he was able to just grab all the chat history from all those companies. Um, so here's another example. Um, basically, a developer accidentally committed an AWS token, and then that organization was served with a, a $2,000 bill that month from AWS because someone had taken that credential and used it to mine Bitcoin on, on that, uh, uh, that company's account. Um, so that's, that's a pretty expensive mistake, um, but it does get worse. Um, in this particular instance, again, AWS token cr committed to GitHub. Um, this organization was served with a $64,000 bill. So that's almost somebody's salary um, because somebody uh, accidentally committed an AWS credential uh, to GitHub. Um, so these, these certainly can be very expensive mistakes. Um, and then I'm sure most folks are familiar with this one. Uh, Uber recently in the last year um, uh, 
a researcher identified uh, an AWS credential that was committed to their GitHub, and uh, that researcher may or may not have extorted Uber for $100,000, um, and Uber paid out. Uh, and so it became national news uh, because that credential uh, had access to tons of user information. Um, and it definitely uh, got a high amount of visibility. I think the CISO of Uber ended up testifying in front of Congress about it. Um, what folks may not remember, though, is just two years prior, um, Uber had another AWS token that was committed to GitHub. Um, and this one was actually kind of interesting because GitHub um, was subpoenaed by Uber, uh, requesting all the IP addresses that accessed that resource because they wanted to know if anyone used this for uh, nefarious purposes. Um, so it kind of just speaks to like this, this mistake can lead to subpoenas, litigation, like multi-thousand dollar um, uh, bills on your account. Um, and it's you know, sometimes really hard to, to figure out um, who's used this credential. In this case, they had to subpoena GitHub to, to get the answer to that, answer, to that, that question. Um, so this is not a talk telling you um, where you should store your credentials. Um, there's a ton of options out there, and depending on your infrastructure, um, you should definitely pick the option that makes the most sense to you. I'm not here to tell you you should store it in environment variables or Unix domain sockets. Um, you should uh, do that research for yourself. This is a talk more just telling you not to store it in GitHub. Um, so you can see truffle hog up there is that tiny border collie up in the corner, and all those lambs are your AWS tokens, and Truffle Hog's goal is to herd them all into your secrets management solution. Um, so sort of at a high level, when we think about where source code lives, it sounds like an obvious, um, like th there's an obvious answer to that, it lives in version control. But when you stop to think about it a little further, our source code actually lives a lot of other places. So for example, um, Package managers contain source code, and package managers and version control can be out of sync with one another. So what's published to your internal or external NPM, PyPy, take your pick, um, may not necessarily reflect what's in GitHub. Um, mobile applications, every time you download uh, a mobile app, say an APK for an Android app, you're downloading a whole bunch of source code for it. Um, and folks have spiked on, again, identifying secrets that actually get packaged into those APKs and shipped out to, to users. Um, Slack, like folks will post snippets of code, they'll upload files asking for help. Um, tons of source code ends up in Slack. Um, Websites, this one's kind of a funny one, but if you, if you stop and start analyzing HTML and looking through comment blocks and looking through like, um, like uh, JavaScript variables and stuff like that, you'll find tons of credentials, sometimes commented out basic auth credentials that were used when the application was internal, just as the first round of auth, but the password is still there and it's a sensitive password used in other contexts. Um, but the bulk of my talk here is going to focus on the last bullet point here, revision history, right? In version control, you have the most recent incarnation of source code, um, and that's typically where people go to look for vulnerabilities. But we have this entire mountain of buried source code in the revision history that we don't tend to pay a lot of attention to. Um, so I have a, an example here. This is the uh, Facebook's React um, public GitHub repository. And on the top, in green, you can see all the contributions that were added to the GitHub uh, project. But more interestingly, on the bottom here, you can see all the code that was taken away from the project since, uh, since it started. And there's as much, if not more, code buried in revision control on the bottom there than there is in the current version on the top. And this is consistent across most projects you look at. There's actually a tremendous amount of code that's, that's buried in, in version control. Um, and, and, and this is a problem when it comes to secrets and source code. For most vulnerabilities, this isn't an issue. You have a problem, you can patch it, you can fix it, and then folks are only going to uh, download the most recent version of the code going forward. But if you commit a secret to source code and then you push over the top of it, that, that revision control is still accessible. And if that token is live, um, it can still be found and still be used. Um, so this is really common, and one of the 
top most common reasons, I think, um, is a developer may accidentally push a credential and then they'll push that upstream and then other folks will pull that down on their local workstations. They'll realize they made the mistake and then they'll know if they, if they um, modify the source code further at that point, all the other developers will have to do a force pull and they'll have to merge and fix their, their Git uh, history. And it'll be really visible and uh, to save themselves the embarrassment, I think oftentimes they'll just push over the top of it um, rationalizing that no one will ever look back there. Or it, it can't be found because it'll be buried in a mountain of other commits. Um, that's, that's a really common pattern I've seen. A, another common pattern is maybe just a new feature comes that just completely replaces an old feature. So maybe you're, you're working on a new application and you decide to temporarily store files in S3. And then at some point you say to yourself, actually, I want to move to SQS and I want to use their pub sub instead of temporarily using S3 for that. So you, you replace that large swath of code and you put a new credential in. You put an uh, SQS credential in replacing the S3 credential. But the S3 credential is still there. It's still in re uh, revision control. And later, when somebody does a review of the source code and they find that SQS credential and they remove that and rotate it, it doesn't actually remove the old S3 cred that's still live and still buried in source control. And that kind of leads into the next point here. When folks go to do their open source review, um, if you work for a company and you want to open source something, usually there's an open source review process. Security will do an audit, but the vast majority of the time when security does an audit, this includes myself, we only look at the latest incarnation of the code. We don't go back and read all the old, you know, buried history. We don't read the, the, the negative commits that I showed earlier. And so if devs know this going in, they're going to want to do some cleanup before it reaches the open source software review. And when they do their cleanup, they may fix some cross-site scripting vulnerabilities. They may um, you know, do some last minute tune-ups. One of those tune-ups may be removing credentials. Um, but they may use the pattern I mentioned before to do that. They'll just push over the top, and then the security guy will get the, get the code. They'll do the review. Uh, and they'll only look at the latest incarnation uh, of, of the code. They won't look at the, uh, the, the, the buried commit history. Um, so uh, I, I have nothing up my sleeves. Um, I, I took this screenshot an hour ago because I wanted it to be as, as fresh as possible. Um, I, I went into GitHub and I did the same uh, sort of uh, Google dorking approach. I, I searched removed password into GitHub. And you can see there's almost half a million commits here. Um, of folks removing their, their, their password. And if you click it, you can see what the password was because it's, it's still in revision control. Um, here's another one, removed AWS key. A again, those breaches and bills that I gave you were examples from a year ago. Uh, this is from a, couple of, from a couple of days ago or from a day ago in the top example, it looks like. Um, there's nothing stopping people from using these. And if I was a bad guy, and I wanted to do some nefarious stuff. Um, I, I wouldn't want to put down an AWS credit card and give them a bunch of attribution on how to find me. So I'd probably either use a stolen credit card or I'd just go find somebody else's credential and do it from their account. This is a really easy way to do that. Um, let's say you want a man in the middle of some traffic. Uh, this is a really great way to get SSL certificates. Um, it's really hard to figure out what cert goes to what without a tremendous amount of effort. Um, so the effort I'm envisioning here is maybe you were to go pull all of these private keys, and then you were to go to all the top websites, maybe the Alexa 1 million, pull all their public keys. Then you can cross-reference those and try to figure out what goes to what. Um, so most people aren't doing that. And so there's probably a ton of live valid creds here. Um, and just nobody's expanding the effort to figure out what's live and, and what's just a, a test certificate that doesn't matter. Um, and then, you know, this talk is on secrets. It's not specifically on tokens or passwords. Um, so another really, uh, you know, good exploitation use uh, of this sort of going through revision control here. Um, let's say you're doing reconnaissance on a company because you want to break into them. Um, one of the things you may want to do is enumerate all of their domains, both internal and external. Um, a lot of times what happens is when you're developing a project internally, before it becomes open source, you have a ton of references to internal host names, which again, you'll strip out for the open source review, but they'll still be in revision control. So it's very easy to go through and find all of those old, um, 
internal domain references and then figure out all kinds of topology about their internal and external environment um, based on the uh, domain names that were committed to source code. Um, so here's an example um, that Netflix gave me permission to show. Uh, again, it's, it's just the same thing. They pushed you over the top of this credential. It was buried. Um, it's no longer live, um, but you can still access the non-live one on Netflix's public GitHub. Uh, somebody just committed an AWS credential. Um, and so basically, we need some way to scan these old commits. Um, nobody wants to go through and read all the old negative commits just to look for this one class of vulnerability. Um, so that's, that's really the reason why I made Triple Hog. Um, you can't really grep for these. I'm not exactly sure why. I'm not an expert in the Git protocol, but the blobs that Git stores in the .git directory are um, not in a format that can be easily grepped. Um, so basically, I just wanted a tool that could go through all the old ver revision history of all the branches, and it can find um, secrets that were otherwise not in the latest version of the, the source code. Um, so it's an open source tool. Uh, it does exactly that. It goes through all the branches, um, and its job is just to identify secrets that were um, intentionally or accidentally um, committed to, see to source code. Um, so when I first started the Truffle Hog project, I, I wanted to like sort of just prove the point, like ship the minimalist amount of effort that I could um, to, to find and identify these secrets. So the way I, I first set this up is I said, go through all the old revision history, and if anything looks like it's sort of high entropy, let me know. Um, that way I can find um, sort of a lot of secrets um, but, th but there'll be a lot of noise with it as well, like URLs that have high entropy, um, just large blobs of Base64 have high entropy. Um, I put some restrictions on it, like it has to match certain character sets and certain lengths. Um, and, and it was effective. It did find that Netflix um, AWS token that I mentioned before. Um, but one of the problems was it false positive like crazy. This is the exact same repo from Netflix and just a couple of lines down, it false positived on a URL because the URL had a bunch of entropy in it. Um, so this tool was really good for like pen tests and it was good if you wanted to do like a, a one-off open source review of a piece of software. Great for bug bounties, um, quite lucrative. Uh, you can, you know, a, a bug bountier can run this and go through all the false positives because they don't care, they're just looking for the one payout. Um, but this is really bad for like DevSecOps. Um, this, this model doesn't really scale well. If you were to deliver these results directly to developers, every time they push a URL to their um, revision control, they'd get an alert saying they pushed a secret. Um, and eventually they'd just start tuning it out. Um, so th this model doesn't really scale that well. Um, and, and that goes the same with the security team. Like if you have security alert every time this entropy detection happened on any source code anywhere in the company, um, they'll, they'll just start tuning it out because it's, it's tons and tons of false positives. So it's really good for like one-offs, for sensitive assets, um, for bug bounties, but not that great for like a company um, using at scale. So I pivoted a little bit. I did exactly what I didn't want to do. And I uh, wrote a bunch of really high signal, um, basically regu regular expressions to specifically look for specific types of uh, secrets that way, when those flagged, we can suppress the uh, entropy detection and only run the regexes. And when those flagged, we could be a lot more confident in giving these results directly to a developer or just, again, setting up a, a, a triage queue for security to go through. And it wouldn't, it wouldn't be uh, quite as bad. So you can see um, sort of a screenshot of a, some regexes up there. Um, the big downside to this, though, is like, there's a ton of different types of tokens out there that this doesn't flag on. Like, you can see the whole list of regexes up there, and I'm sure you can think of public cloud um, API keys that aren't on that list. Um, I, I do accept new pull requests, but that list is gonna continue to grow forever. Um, and, and doing things this way will miss all of those tokens. Um, and another downside is it, it still does um, require some manual triage. So after it identifies an AWS token, it doesn't know if it's live or not. So somebody has to come in and figure that out. Um, but one of, the, one of the upsides of doing it this way is 
Um, one, of, one of the upsides of doing it this way um, is it, it will, uh, in some cases, detect low entropy secrets. So for example, I have a regex um, that I haven't pushed yet, but I, I will in the next couple of days, that identifies um, if somebody hard-coded a password into a URL, um, like before the domain, and um, that password can be super low entropy, but the regex would pick up on it anyway. The, uh, the entropy detection wouldn't. Um, so when I say high signal, this is sort of what I mean. Like when I first started on the left there is what a, uh, a regex for a GitHub access token used to look like. Basically if the string GitHub followed by a 35 to 40 character um, hex string showed up in a single line, um, then I would have it flag and that false positive like crazy. Um, the reason why um, any GitHub URL usually had a commit, uh, commit hash in the URL, and that satisfies that regex, so that false positive. Um, a giant monolith of minified JavaScript code would false positive, because somewhere in the monolith, this two megabyte file is the string GitHub, and somewhere else is a, a hex string. So I, I spent some time refining and tweaking these over time to make them more, more accurate. So what I ended up for this particular one doing is, if the string GitHub shows up, in the next zero to 30 characters, if a, uh, if a quote or a, a, a white space shows up, followed by the right character set in the right length, terminated again by a quote or a white space, then alert me. Um, so I, I'm really doing the best I can here to make sure that the rules that I introduce here are as high signal as possible um, so that these can be given directly to developers and we don't have a mountain of false positives. Um, so sort of when you hook all of that up, this is sort of the model in my head of, of what that looks like. Um, and I've implemented this a couple of times. Um, you, you have some sort of hook that fires. Um, this could be a build pipeline. You could have Jenkins or something like that kick this off. Um, where every time a new commit or build comes in, Truffle Hog runs. And you give Truffle Hog a flag to tell it run from this commit onward. So you keep track of where you've already scanned. You give it a new commit. Truffle Hog will scan that deliver the results somehow to someone. That could be directly to a developer, it could be to an SRE, it could be to a security engineer. Then you have to triage them, figure out what's live, what's not, deal with uh, what false positives there are. Um, and then finally, you gotta remediate. So when I say remediate, um, it's a kind of a pain in the butt to remediate, but um, first you gotta pull it out of source code. Use something like uh, Big Friendly Repo Cleaner to do that, the BFG Repo Cleaner. Um, then you got to rotate the credential. Um, you got to keep track of which ones have been rotated and which ones haven't. Um, and you got to do that in a secure way. So that's, that's another sort of tricky nuance to this is like, once you set all this automation up and you're identifying these credentials, like it's a bit dodgy to have like a big repository of, hey, look, here's exactly where all the clear text credentials are. Um, and so you have to be sort of clever about the way you do that. You don't want to log the credentials, for example, um, because then you've got another repository of clear text credentials that you don't want. Um, so you have to be careful with the way you're, you're storing them, keeping track of that. Um, and then finally, what I mentioned before, all the folks have already moved forward in their Git histories. So if you go back and you laser something out, everybody has to do a for force merge and deal with the annoying merge conflicts that come from that. Um, but if you remember back earlier, like I mentioned most of what I would be talking about would be focused on um, cleaning up revision history. But there are a ton of other places that we keep our source code. Um, like I gave that big list and the second one on the list was package managers. And if you remember what I said earlier, um, Package managers can be completely out of sync with GitHub. And the reason why is, in the case of NPM and PyPy, the two that I spiked on, and this is by no means a complete list of package managers that have this problem, um, these package managers only look at the file system when you package to them. They don't look at what's in Git or what's in GitHub. So, for example, if you're an engineer and you're working on a project and you have some testing script or some environment variable sourcing script in the directory of your project, and you don't commit it to GitHub, when you run your, let me package this up to PyPy script, there's a good chance that those scripts will end up in PyPy, but they won't end up in GitHub. 
And when, again, when the reviewer does the review, um, whether that be an open source review uh, or just an internal security audit or maybe just a code review, um, people are checking what's in GitHub. Nobody's pulling down the package and untarring it and reading that source code. Um, you're already reading what's in GitHub. Nobody wants to double that effort. Um, and these packages are also versioned. Um, just like revision control, we have a long history of the same piece of code that's pushed up again and again and again and iterated on. All of those old versions could potentially have these problems. You may have an environment variable sourcing script that was committed in one of the old versions. Um, and again, like nobody has the time to go through all the same duplicate incarnations of the same code looking for that environment variable script. Um, so recently, uh, I spiked on a way to go through and scan those in the same capacity. Um, but what I found was, basically, if you publish to NPM or PyPy, and anywhere in the description of your project, you have the string AWS, there's about a 2% chance of that package having a live AWS credential. Um, now, when I first did this, I notified the folks where I could find the credential, but that was the criteria I was using to figure out which packages to scan. So I'm sure there's a ton of other projects out there that have live credentials, and I'm sure since that time, more folks have committed live credentials. Um, I mentioned some of the reasons. I'll say them again, so it could be environment variables. You could have um, test scripts, so maybe you've got some tests that you haven't staged yet. Maybe experimental code, like I'm personally guilty of this when I'm iterating before I commit to version control. I'll just inline the credential just because I want to test something first. When I'm first trying out an API, I want to figure out how it works. Um, that code, if it's in an active project where you're committing stuff, could end up getting zipped up and, and sent to NPM or PyPy. Um, so um, I'm not uh, by any means saying that this was a good name for it, but <laughs> I have a new script. Um, called Santa Hog that basically uh, is, is designed to do just that. Um, I guess my thinking was like, you're, you're getting like goodies out of a package and that's, that's kind of what Santa does. Um, and I kept the hog for consistency. Um, but basically, uh, name aside, it goes through all the old versions of the package in NPM and PyPy um, and it, it scans for the same exact regexes, and it's got the high entropy flag as well if you want to do that entropy detection. Um, it's also open source, um, and it's available on my GitHub. Um, so here's an example of its output. It doesn't quite look as pretty as the truffle hog output, um, but here I'm running it on one of Uber's packages, um, T-Channel, and you can see it flagged a couple of times. It flagged on RSA private keys, it flagged on an AWS credential, all in this one package. But if you look at it a little bit more carefully, you'll notice that these things that flagged were in a directory called node modules. And if you know anything about NPM, um, node modules is basically the directory where all of your dependencies get stored. So tchannel's dependencies basically live in the node modules directory. And in this case, um, what tchannel did was they took their node modules directory and um, they ended up pushing that to, uh, to version control. You can kind of think of that as like a statically compiled binary, except most people don't do this. It was probably done by accident, and it was only in one of the versions of T-Channel. Um, but what they did was they introduced a dependency of a dependency of a dependency of a dependency of a dependency that ultimately, all the way down that chain, that dependency of somebody else way outside of Uber committed an RSA private key and an AWS credential. So Uber took that other person's secret, packaged it into their own package, and then shipped it to T-Channel. So if you were to scan Uber's um, packages, you'd find credentials that actually have nothing to do with Uber and were just accidentally included because they included all of their sub-dependencies. Um, so if we go back to our diagram here, Basically, we have the same triage and remediation step. We're just adding an additional hook from when we packaged NPM and PyPy um, to run, again, the Santa Hog tool. Um, and this is what the new uh, revised DevOps pipeline um, could look like if you were scanning those two sources of, uh, uh, of code. Um, so be because at this point I have two projects, um, 
that are relying on these regular expressions. Um, and at this point, like a bunch of other projects um, started doing the same thing. Um, so for example, somebody uh, wrote uh, a Go version of Trufflehog called GitLeaks, and they had basically copy-pasted the regular expressions over. I just decided to pull the regexes out and put, their in, put them in their own package. That way the whole community can just point to one common place and we can all write the same rules. Um, some other examples of projects um, that are doing similar things, Yelp Detect Secrets, uh, sort of the same deal. They wrote like an enterprise -y version of Trufflehog. And then Lyft did the same thing as well. They forked Trufflehog and they have sort of some enterprise features. And they've, they've also submitted back um, a bunch of features to, to, to my version of Trufflehog. Um, but I pulled these regexes out just so all these projects can just point to one uh, unified source of truth for the, uh, for the, rule, for the rules. And then they can uh, use their own engines. Um, so one thing I want to har harpen back to for a second is I mentioned um, that you have to have this like manual triage phase where someone figures out whether or not this credential is live. Um, Trufflehog is at its core a static analysis tool. Um, but when you combine static analysis with dynamic analysis, you can potentially remove this triage phase and you can automate the testing of these credentials and just create a system that only outputs true positives. So basically, you could think of that as Trufflehog runs, it finds an AWS credential, and then you test to see whether or not that credential is live all automatically. And then if it is live, then you can get notified for it. Um, and so that's really easy to do for public, uh, uh, public cloud. So you can do it for an AWS credential. It's a little bit harder to do for, say, an RSA private key. You'd have to, again, do something like I mentioned before, aggregate a whole bunch of public keys and cross-reference it and stuff like that. So this can work in some search situations. Other situations, it doesn't work as well. And this is sort of what that can look like. This is just a really simple Python script I wrote that takes an AWS key, calls get caller identity on it. That's a, um, an API endpoint that any AWS credential with any permissions can always call. If we get an exception, um, we know the key is not live. Uh, and if the, key, um, if the key successfully makes the call, then we know the credential is live. And now we can pretty much automate the whole process when it comes to AWS keys in particular. Anytime a developer commits an AWS key, um, we'll know um, whether or not the credential is live. And we can automatically start uh, remediation without having to deal with any kind of false positive and any kind of triage. Um, so that, that sounds good, but that comes with a huge like asterisk. Um, so I'm not, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not going to tell you um, any kind of legal advice. But um, if you remember back to the Uber example, that wasn't Uber's credential. That was some stranger's credential. And if you start taking those and offing with them, um, you're probably violating the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Not a lawyer. I'm not going to tell you whether it is or not. but. You're taking somebody else's cred and signing into something without them giving you permission to do it with that cred. It sounds like a violation of the CFAA. So you have to be really careful with that. And you probably shouldn't do this with bug bounties either. Again, for the same reason, um, companies typically will say, if you find a credential, um, stop testing there, report it to us, don't test it. Um, and that, uh, you know, if, if you were to set up this automated process of just automatically logging into services, you'd probably violate the CFAA, you'd probably violate the bug bounty terms of services. Um, so just be careful with systems like that. Um, I, I say that knowing that, you know, the, the benefit that you get from this is probably worth the accidental CFAA violation, but um, I guess that's something to, to be cognizant of nonetheless. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, Source code lives in many places, and I've only spiked on a very small portion of those places. Some other um, folks wrote this tool that basically does the same thing for mobile apps. You give it an APK name, and it will pull down that mobile app. It'll uh, extract the APK, it'll decompile it, and it'll look for, uh, for secrets in the APK. Um, so this tool is great, and I've definitely used it before. Um, but just think of all the other places that we have source code. Um, Google Drive, um, email, wherever else. Like th these are all potentially um, future projections forward of, of this project or others similar. Um, 
So, you know, that leads right into this point. Like, I, I could use the community help for the rest of that. Like, of all the package managers out there, I've only spiked on two. And of all the places source code could live, I, you know, of all those bullet points I had, I only looked at two of those. Um, I, I could really use help building this out more. Um, I do accept also um, pull requests for new rules, provided that they're high signal enough. And I've seen contributions from companies like Netflix, Microsoft, Lyft, um, and others. Um, so it's, it's all available on my GitHub, and I, and I encourage um, community support. And the regular expressions are available for other, other uh, related and tangential projects. Um, these are the resources to the things that I've talked about so far. Um, by all means, check them out, take a picture. Um, and that's pretty much all I have for you. Um, so I guess I have another couple of minutes if I have any questions. So there's a question in the, yes. Um, yeah, so I, I had a little bit of a hard time hearing the question. I heard um, plans to integrate with... Uh, here it's a code review tool, right? Yeah. Yeah, so the question is basically like, are there plans to, to take Truffle Hog and, and build it into existing code review tools? An example of this, Garrett. Um, I don't have any direct plans to do that, but that being said, um, that sounds like a good idea, and I'd be happy to work with folks who, who would like to integrate it with other solutions. Um, it is importable as a library, um, and so if you're already in Python, it's relatively easy to do. Um, but otherwise, um, feel free to chat with me after and we can figure out a way to do it. Um, sure. um, do you have any benchmarks on how fast your tool runs over how many lines of Yeah, so the question is do you have any benchmarks uh, for how fast it is? Um, I don't, but I know that it's changed a lot. Um, and a lot of that has come from the community who have added uh, performance increases. So when I first rolled this out as its first proof of concept, it used to go through each branch and scan each commit, um, even if the commits were the same in the branches, so even if the hashes and everything exactly matched up, which was a huge waste of time. So someone from the community pointed that out and then um, added some extra functionality so that it wouldn't scan those commits, and the time dropped dramatically. Um, and then there were a couple other optimizations that were added as well. So it went from like, if you were to run this on the Linux kernel originally, it would probably take a week or more to finish down to, if you were to run this on the Linux kernel today, it would probably take on the order of, like, maybe hours. Um, and that's kind of an extreme example. Most projects, it'll finish in, you know, seconds to minutes. Um, yes, up front. Yeah, so um, is there any way to turn entropy and regex on, but have uh, entropy go first, and then filter it down from that using the regex? I'm trying to manage uh, false positives. I get a lot of false positives on entropy because of, there's a lot of hashes in the repo and stuff like that. Yeah, totally. So the question was basically like, is there any way, I think, to see whether or not it satisfies both entropy and regex? Yeah, but like, so entropy first to grab all the entropy, you know, uh, hits, and then filter down from that using regex. Like, what has entropy and matches the regex? You know what I mean? Gotcha. Yeah, so the quest question, I think, was, First run entropy, and then from the results of entropy, run the regex tools. Um, is, is there any functionality for that? Um, there isn't uh, super native functionality for that, but like I mentioned before, um, you can just import the library and then run it twice in that order, um, and, and that should be relatively easy to do. Um, happy to help you out with that if that's um, something you want to pursue further. Um, any other questions? Yes. Yeah, so the question is, what's the format of the rules? It's just, uh, it's, it's currently JSON. A lot of people yell at me and tell me it should be YAML. Um, but uh, I, I do it in JSON because I really don't like YAML deserialization bugs. Um, so it's, it's just a JSON key value pair of uh, key to regular expression. Yeah. Um, other questions? Cool. Well, 
Thanks for having me, everyone.